Hey. And <laughs> welcome to the, <laughs> to the Identity Podcast brought to you by Find Your ID NYC. Don't forget to go ahead and follow us on Facebook right here at Find Your ID NYC. And you can check us out on Instagram by the same name. Check out our YouTube page at The X Shows. It's pretty cool, if I do say so myself. Uh, I am one of your co-hosts, Caleb, along with my fellow lovely co-host, Tyreek. I think he's What's extra up, everybody? today. What do you think? <laughs> I'm feeling good. I'm feeling no, good. You know what? I found I found a um, a gift or some sort of like little emoji that has a Hawaiian shirt on it. Really? So I think of, yeah, I'm gonna post it for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I'm feeling. But yeah, You're the best. <laughs> you are the best. I tell you. Um, <laughs> well, it's it's my it's my absolute pleasure to be able to do our 20th episode of the Identity Podcast. It's crazy to think. 20 episodes in and it's almost the end of 20, 2020 in 2020 yeah you see that i right? know i know the craziness uh <laughs> too bad i don't have 2020 <laughs> vision oh. anyways uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and get ready for today's show podcast uh very excited uh to to have this episode and, and to kick off religious philosophy with none other than our very special guest for this week's show and that is professor james lynch how are you Fantastic! I'm glad to have be have be here at this moment. Thank you very much for having. Me. That's awesome. Well, it's an absolute honor to have you. That's for certain. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about to talk about Buddhism, to talk about uh, your teaching, to talk about what you are currently doing as the current president of the Buddhist Council of New York. I, I think there's so many different things that we can we can talk about and really really divulge in for uh, this week's episode. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be great. I, I'm excited. I think, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I've been kind of uh, jittery today, just ready for today's Indeed. episode. <laughs> I'll tell you, Caleb. It's so funny though. Um, backstage, I feel like, you know, definitely got rid of all of those jitters very quickly. Him. Is he here? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're good, we're good. I'm good, I'm good, I'm listening. Okay, good. I'm here. Yeah, you got rid of all those I'm jitters, here. man. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate that, man. I, I, you, you spoke about um, not being able to watch some of our episodes, but I was having a similar time with you, just going through your accolades and just going through all the stuff that you've done. You have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your hands in so many different pots, um, much like a mandala. You know, we're all our <laughs> dust, but like, just all over yeah. the place. You know. Yeah, uh, I guess. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you. I appreciate you getting, taking time out with this today. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, kind of backstage, you know, wherever you want to begin, I kind of like to start, um, since this is our religious episode, I know you didn't get a chance to look at a lot of them, but we've interviewed, um, um, some Muslim women that were breaking boundaries as far as it's, it's, it's considered for women, uh, as well as religion. Um, we've had several other Christian folk. We've also had some people that have crossed religions. They've moved all over into Muslim mm -hmm. due to marriage and a bunch of it's like it's all over the place. So specifically, yeah. I've heard a <laughs> little birdie said that you uh, originally came from a Christian background. Yes. So how has that transitioned into where we are right now? Uh, well, thank where you. We are right now. No, I mean, um, it has been a long journey. I think the interesting part about it is that I was studying to be a Christian minister at one time. I'm currently an interfaith minister as well. You know, but I think that the, the real journey uh, for me was this, you know, you had Jesus say things like uh, love one and love one another as I've loved you. Right. That sort of thing. How do you do that? How do we do the process of loving other people as Jesus commands us to do? Mm -hmm. Started really the process of the how made me become a Buddhist. My mother was a Buddhist as well. She was doing that journey and I'm following mom. Right. And um uh, again, I'm an African American, so it was kind of an unusual move. My great grandparents were all ministers. Wow, my family, you know, out of slavery, even they were ministers. So, so what, what time period are we talking right here? Like, where, I'm, where I'm are not, we? I'm about 100 years old. <laughs> 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 so my, my, um, I, I started, I think, the Buddhist journey back in 1976. I didn't wow. join the group that I belong to now, but uh. I had, you know, I was studying being a minister. I went to college. I went to school called Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. I studied religious studies there. I was interested in becoming a minister. That was what I was doing. And then I, too many people were saying, hey, James, you know, you've got this insight. And I was like, people are weirding out. You know, that's not what Christianity is about. Mm -hmm. it's about finding ways to love your neighbors 
mm-hmm. you know, in a way that you're interconnected through relationship. And so mm-hmm. let, me, let me not weird out on people's ego and on my own. And let me start this other path of searching. And it took a while. I belonged to religious groups. And then eventually I joined the one that I currently belong to, Risho Kosakai, which is the second largest uh, lay Buddhist organization in the world. It's Japanese uh, in focus. I was trained as a Dharma teacher in Japan. I'm officially certified as a Dharma teacher. And, and you saw, you'll see it up there. I'm the president of the Buddhist Council. I'm African American, the first African American uh, president of the Buddhist Council. There are about over a million members of the Buddhist Council of New York here in the tri state area. So, um, primarily of the heritage community. So, that's the journey in a lot of ways. But the journey is how do we treat, how do we recognize the suffering that was in my community? I had mm. also had a company housing homeless women and children called Renaissance Development Corporation. I saw the situation of people being exploited in the community. I wanted to figure out a way out. So, wow. so take up so much time, but that's, that's no. Little, this is your time. Backdrop. You asked. I want to make sure. Oh I'm, my god! Backdrop, mic drop, everything. Sorry. I mean, you know that. that <laughs> don't ever apologize for that, man. That was amazing. I mean, I really feel like I wanted to let you get it all out, but I mean, each one of those nuggets of information people would, you know, be so happy about for one part of their life. So mm-hmm. you walked many paths. I like the way you described it. You know, I won't put you too much on the spot, but I also like the way you described it where, you know, even what you're doing right now is an expression of Christianity. And I think that that's, that's such a beautiful way to look at it. I've often had that. I actually come from uh, religious. <laughs> There's Imani talking to you for your comments. If anyone that's uh, listening and can't see us, uh, she said first African-American, it just went away. Uh, we were just giving some more accolades to uh, Professor James right here. But I'm curious to say like, because I, I come from a, a Christian background as well. Um, and my mom is a minister now. Uh, okay. My dad's more on the Muslim side. So, okay. um, and he's kind of defected from that and gone into what you describe more as a, not necessarily a spiritualist, but a, um, knowledgeable of all religions so that you can be w- wise in what you want to get done, or what God's purpose is for you in that extent, you know? Mm-hmm. So along those, along that path, I have, uh, you know, I, I've understood what it means to be meek like Christ. I've understood what it means to really be the true humanitarian that um, we all describe. And it's kind of the ideal for America. But you you mentioned jumping from two different cultures, you know, um, the Asian community, uh, and that's a broad community because you were actually in Japan. I was in Japan as well. And they have, a you know, their culture is a, l- a little different, but as far as the Buddhist Asian community, they're very tight knit and it's a very difficult to penetrate certain times those aspects as much as it is sometimes so freely loving. Um, whereas the opposite, you know, Christianity is very open to all sorts of places and stuff. So how did you find your your place in such a tight knit group of people? I think the beautiful part about it is wonderful being an African American here in the United States because we've had to uh, figure our way through difficult times, through challenges. Right. And um, that's given me an opportunity to understand that I can connect with other people's lives and their suffering. So mm-hmm. Buddha deals with people suffering where they're at. So wherever I go, whether I be in, in um, Japan or was it the Philippines or wherever it was, the goal is always to respect the people in front of me. And in my Buddhism practice is to revere them as sacred. So even when we were practicing, we were starting this process before we got on the air right now. And I meant what I said. I said, every moment is sacred. So people mm-hmm. listening to this through the podcast and they're hearing it in their minds. Mm-hmm. And if they realize that their life is sacred. So you ask me, how did I do that? If you revere people and say that the people are sacred, wherever you go, regardless of their culture, you could be in Zimbabwe, you could be in uh, Japan, you could be in China, you'll mm-hmm. connect with them and they can see if you're fake. You know, if you're keeping it real, they'll know you're keeping it real. Mm-hmm. Feel your love and compassion for them. And they'll respond. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. Know, they'll respond to that. Yes, I, I love this. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna take a note to that because- um, That was beautiful. Yeah, as far as, uh, as, far as the Buddhist, uh, religion is concerned is very much about humility and i'm sorry if we ever do you know make you feel uncomfortable by giving you the accolades but we want to give you flowers while you're here or before you turn into a, a goat or a cow or something but uh <laughs> I'm out. I'm myself lifting. <laughs> I'm <gonna> disappear. Don't <laughs> sorry about that move no. the whole uh my whole rig here That's all right. you had me dying um so uh <laughs> 
I, I'm curious, I'm curious that um like this the sacredness and this feeling of, you know, how do you how do you combine this feeling of humbleness with like creating your purpose. I, I know people that find their purpose and they're just like off to the races. You can't tell them anything, but to create, to keep that presence, like you said, and you also spoke about something that's very universal. Um, regardless of what language you speak, love languages, though they have written many books about it, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, how many languages being spoke, but as far as the universal idea of love language, you spoke to something very intense. Um, and I think that's something we've kind of expressed a lot in our podcast and anyone that's gonna go back and look, we've noticed that love has, transcended religion, boundaries, time, space, all the fun stuff, you know? Um, and you you brought highlight to something that is kind of like, people have that internal um, BS meter, quote unquote. But I think what it really has a lot to do with is that universal love connects with each other. And when you genuinely love yourself and you're able to love others, it's a communication at that point. You're able to communicate without words sometimes. So I, I appreciate that. I've actually been to Japan too. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of your journey and how you've gotten to where you are. Um, but yeah, I, I was actually in Japan. And the funniest thing I noticed out there was the Japanese Christian communities. Did you get a chance to actually uh, link or talk to any of those communities? Well, when I was in Japan, no, because I was I was being trained so vigorously, I'll tell you. That. Right. I was going to- Yeah, I would love to get into that too, if you, if you want to talk but, about um, I do, a, I'm on a couple of other things. I'm, I, I belong to the World Parliament uh, of Religions, which is the largest, oldest interfaith uh, international organization, which deals with faith movements. I also am um, oh, uh, an executive member of the Religions for Peace USA, which is the United States largest interfaith religious community. And so, you know, I hear what you're saying. And the, the goal has to be, as I said before, how can we find ways, regardless of the outer expression, mm -hmm. that interconnection that will mm -hmm. You know, you know, I take this as a sacred, like I said, you may think, you know, you get, you gave me this wonderful opportunity to talk to yourselves. I'm so proud of an opportunity to have this opportunity for myself in a way. Mm, it makes me excited, makes me excited. So that's the real key. Uh, mm. How can we find ways to be loving to each other? Mm -hmm. It seems as going mad. And the question that you asked, which was behind that, how do we do that? A lot of times we talk love language, but a lot of times we I call it organized crime love. You do this for me, I do this for you. And we confuse that with a respect and revering of the other person, which says, even if you don't stay with me, I will respect you and honor your growth and path. That's mm -hmm. a much different type of love than saying, I possess you, I control you, mm -hmm. you belong to me. Right. You know, so when you ask that about the Christian community, whether in Japan, or um, a lot of my friends are Korean uh, Christians. Christianity is big in Korea. Mm. You talk to them about that and say, that's the, that's the love that Christ was trying to give and show us and be a model for us. So mm -hmm. we, I understand that. Right. You know, and so then we can go from there. No, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. Do you, do you have a question, Caleb? No, no, I oh, okay. was just... I was loving what I was hearing. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. 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 I have a son, and he thinks so. he says, "Dad, you're a little weird." So don't mind. Don't, don't. <laughs> don't really? Mind. Oh, no, yeah, man. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. little bit. Um, <laughs> well, then uh, you're in good company. Put it that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there's tons of people that watch our show. I'm sure they aren't the normal types, um, and I think that a part of why this is uh, a part of why this is so funny is. A lot of us, you know, at least when we first started this in August, we were rigid, we were on a path. We had no idea what we we're doing, and I, I think it's a lot like how your spiritual journey is going. Um, I'm curious about how you've seen Siddhartha's journey and how that's compared along yours, um, and also just giving us a little more, just like tidbits and principles, um, just about Buddhism because you are actually our first Buddhist on. Well, and I think. I'm very, I'm very again proud. I feel very, I use the term proud. What I mean by that is, I feel very privileged. Indeed, yeah. you know, um, I represent a lot of mostly monks. I'm, I'm a, I'm a lay practitioner. Mm. The people that are on the Buddhist council. That's really a council of elder Buddhists. Wow. They're like, you know, they're one step away from the Dalai Lama and um, uh, things like. That. So for me That's to amazing. for me to be <laughs> yeah, it is a little amazing. <laughs> it's super I'm a, I'm a I mean, practitioner to do that. So it's kind of a little bit I'm honest enough to say it's a little bit kind of like why why did the 
We don't believe in also in Buddhism. There's no coincidence in the universe. You know, mm. it, even though we may have challenges, the fact that your mother gave, father gave you life is a very sacred thing. And so we mm. honor the path that they went through, even if they weren't perfect, right? Parents are not always perfect. They make mistakes. But we honor the fact that they've given us life. And if we really think about it in a really simplistic kind of way, any joy you have is a result of your parents giving you the gift of life. Indeed. And so then you can go back and revere them in a different way. Even mm -hmm. acknowledging that they're fallible and they screamed at you and didn't treat you well. <laughs> 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 That's just the reality. You know, um, parents yeah. are not always sexy, right? They're not always sexy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, um, I go ahead, Caitlin. Uh, let's do one of these these questions since it's along the same topic of um, some Buddhist uh, traditions and ideas and what his perceptive is. So the first one I see here is, "What is Nirvana to you?" I know everyone wants to know about heaven. Uh, let's let's go with Nirvana. Nirvana is an early co Buddhist concept. Literally means to. Uh, uh, Trishna means thirst. Um, Buddha was always talking about it at the end of the day, and one of the things that. Um, Rick mentioned, what's your purpose? The Buddha was always sort of deconstructing what it means to be a human being. What does it mean to be a human being? What's our purpose, right? And when you begin to get rid of notions about who you are, you have a big movement going on, Black Lives Matter. You know, a lot of people don't want to go there. I go where everybody wants to go. Um, what does it mean to have these notions about I'm uh, African American in the United States? What does that mean that my grandparents were slaves in the United States? What does it mean to deconstruct that? What do I mean by deconstruct that? How did they make their journey still positive? Right? So nirvana really means to blow out the notions that you have in your mind that act as prisons about what you think is or isn't real. Hmm. What's possible? When you begin to do that, you begin to realize the society has constructed sometimes prisons that aren't real at all. Hmm. Maybe we can change and mm -hmm. get things with fresh eyes. Buddhists frequently say to see things as they are. Nirvana is the process of beginning to see life as it is. Not mm -hmm. as you fantasize it to be, but as it is. Hmm. And, you know, and sometimes it's not always good. It's not always the way we want things to go. What do you do when things don't go your way? Hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's dope. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was gonna say, um, forgive me for that joke earlier because I made a comment. I was like, I you know everybody always wants to know about heaven, quote unquote, was a joke I was making. But what you're describing is much more of a middle path, I would say, than anything else, mm -hmm. yes. um, than heaven or a hell or something that has been part of the Christian religion. So I have it so ingrained in me, you know, and I've learned a lot of knowledge over my time, and I know. It, they say, you know, train up a child and it'll never, you know, it'll never go from them, you know, from the Bible. So I'm curious about, do some concepts of Christianity come up more? Yeah, like like this, ad, this a lot of people yeah. are still afraid of hell and still afraid of, you know, are aspiring to heaven and still practicing other, maybe new age or quote unquote new age things at this time, even though Buddhism's well, Buddhism, been around Buddhism, forever. Buddhism, but, some Buddhists have that belief about right. you pray and you go to what they call frequently the, the land of tranquil light. Um, in my particular practice, we believe that those worlds are inside of you. Indeed. So heaven and hell are, are reside inside of you. For example, if we yell at each other, we're fighting with each other, uh, you know, uh, the people, uh, whatever, pro, pro Trump, anti Trump, we're fighting in the street, proud boys, whatever they may be, we're in the world of hell. Hmm. Hmm. Right? When we begin the process of self reflection, we may get to the world of humanity. And then beyond that, they call it uh, Shravaka, which is self reflection. Uh, Pradaka Buddha, where you meditate, Bodhisattva practice, where you practice for other people, and Buddhahood. But the key thing is to not think these are stages as so much expressions of reality that are happening in the immediate moment. So right. Buddha can come up at any moment. We don't have to, we don't have to find we have to go and search for it like the Himalayan mountains. It may be good that you guys are sitting here talking to people about different people's faiths. And maybe you mm. do the kindness in your heart. And then you start treating the cab driver differently. Then you can treat your partner differently. You treat your, you know, siblings differently. You know, you start treating the person in the grocery store differently. Mm -hmm. Say them as something sacred. And then your life is much different. Indeed. Look at them as an obstacle, look at them as an opportunity. It's a big difference. Mm, I see, yeah. That's interesting. And I know that's something that Caleb was actually talking about, um, how this, you know, the podcast has kind of enlightened him so much uh, mm -hmm. that he's been able to talk to people so many different ways in different places. So Kay, I, we make a joke, Caleb's 
somewhere in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, his house is floating somewhere. And, somewhere. Uh, it's very <laughs> difficult to talk to people. You know, the Midwest is a little different. So I'm obviously from uh, New York City too. So shout out. <laughs> a little bit, right? You're just like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. No, but um, no, uh, Caleb has learned so much through this process. And he says that he's been able to really connect with people in a lot of different ways. Now, I take that for granted. I'm from New York City. So this is where <laughs> it mixes, it melts, it changes, it becomes, you know, and I think that um, I'm, a, I'm privileged to be that. And so I'm trying to take that little bit of expression. And um, you're actually the first person I've been able to kind of talk about uh, with my trip to, to Japan. I was able mm -hmm. to do that kind of early in my life um, for a month, uh, thanks to my school and some other stuff and other scholarships and stuff. But I, um, I mean, man, it was a different world. We were 24 hours in advance and it, it, was, it, it was a whole different environment. So I still have to, to, to bring reference to the question. We have more questions too. We don't want to get away from it, mm -hmm. but I did have a quick question, more yes. of a funny, funny note question. Because uh, yes. I know you're a very humorous type of person, I so, I, so. Know, <laughs> I know you. Um, you said that you did some training um, in in the Buddhist uh, religion when you were out there. I'm sure they weren't having you carry water and catch flies. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like that. No, nothing so like instead that. Instead of being trained like a Shaolin monk, uh, <laughs> how would you have someone to start to begin? You know, at least even to begin along the journeys that you have to to begin I, with the religion. The beautiful thing is, with my particular group, we say start where you are. Indeed. And because of what I said about the mutual possession of the ten worlds, it's actually a concept called the mutual possession of the ten worlds, and that divinity is not outside of yourself, but is actually revealed in every moment of your life. You start where you are. You say, I'm having difficulty with my friend. I want my business to grow. I want better relationships in my community. I want to see my country thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are. And when you begin to that journey, what does it mean for it to thrive? What it means to have a better relationship? What does it mean to have better relationship? When you start that process, wherever you're mm -hmm. at, that's it. So therefore, mm -hmm. I can embrace assalamu alaikum. I can embrace being a righteous man or woman. Mm -hmm. I can embrace a Christian. I can embrace Judaism's respect for the stranger. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we, we can embrace other people because they, too, are an expression of the divine movement of the almighty universe. And so. Mm. So true, man. So true. It's I, not one way. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I know. I know. No. We, got, we got you on the line. We want you to give us the answers, man. No. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that is the answer. The answer no, no, no. That, that was the joke. Away. That was the joke. Yeah. Was the, no. the joke is that we, we tend to respect people and and like the, the being that you are but rather what you represent and all the achievements that you've done like believe me we're gonna have some conversations after the podcast it's just how amazing you've done all this stuff let me let me hit some of these questions so no one yeah goes, yeah i can not uh, talking anyway. go ahead i'll Caleb. pull them up here uh, uh yeah another question um that's really fascinating to me is how many black buddhists have you actually met through this journey thousands there are thousands of black buddhists but they tend to be uh, marginalized a lot of the time reason why it's quite amazing that I'm the president of the Buddhist Council, isn't it? But again, I say there's no coincidence in the universe. Indeed. Me, you know, I don't I like to take a lot of pictures of myself. I remember we started, he said, you have the bright light. I don't have, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the light. I'll go to the light. Yeah, bones, sure. right? Whatever it is, I'm going to be a bunch of bones. The, the, the end of the day is I believe that everybody has something to say about the great mosaic that we call the life. And in our Buddhism, we call it the great life of the universe. Hmm. A lot of black Buddhists are there struggling so that their voices can be heard, just like you mm -hmm. see watching for dignity, whatever they may be doing. But mm -hmm. I think they have a lot to say about the transformation of suffering in a peaceful way. And community, people who look like me need to hear that message that we can love ourselves, not by hating others, but by revering our own sacred nature that the universe has created and ordained be real. You don't have to, don't have to back away from it. You can be firm on it, but you also have to respect everyone else that this was a miracle process for them too. Right. Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. <laughs> that goes back into your concept of treating everything sacred, treating time as sacred. Um, and the irony of that is maybe not necessarily treating time as sacred, but you know, energies that exist. Cause you mentioned, um, 
how a lot of people look at stuff as stages. You know, like people are like, oh, I'm at this religious stage or I'm this Christian and I'm, you know, uh, I used to be a sinner and I'm backsliding and all these positions in Christianity. Yeah. A lot of it has a lot to do with, like you said, linear logic and, you know, temporal logic. And it seems like you've kind of like pulled yourself back, you know, like I'm not even in this body. I'm not really James Lynch. I'm not really, you know what I mean? It's like you're in this like this eternal ether, you know, and that's why I was making a joke of don't go into the light. You know, a lot of people say when you're moving and your spirit's moving at life force, <laughs> you're able to go into the light. And, and I think that's our collective consciousness. I was reading something about that uh, as well, mm -hmm. how we all, you know, share this collective spirit light being which goes back to the universal love um and these concepts that we were talking about as well um along the same question about the black buddhism before we move fully on who were your uh you know as you're coming up who were some black buddhists that you were like wow that's cool i was gonna name one obviously tina turner <laughs> yeah well, you know funny tina turner she belonged to the same group that i did as a soka gakai at the time that was one of the wow. chants and i do the same sort of thing but in a different context now i'm so she was a well-known Buddhist, but I, what I'm trying to say at that time, 1976, she had recently become a Buddhist. Right. That's what I'm asking you. I'm like, you're yes, in a yeah. time. Just yeah. because the person is famous um, wasn't the thing for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I wanted stuff. I wanted to be, I was, I'm, seriously, I was a professional actor here in New York City and uh, I did all four Broadway shows. And I guess I wanted to have success in those uh, endeavors. Mm. But I think what impressed me more was people, average people, black people, struggling in their lives and overcoming the challenges that they had. Mm. You know, it wasn't, you know, that, you know, one one of the famous things uh, when I was studying with a Christian minister, a man named uh, um, Reverend Barker, just call him the hammer. He said, you know, everybody talks about the time Jesus walked on the water. They never talk about the times he fell in. And what he was trying to say is, <laughs> he's not being real, he's being metaphorical there. He's trying to say the miracle not just walking on water, but is walking with love on the land. Mm. A miracle. Mm. You, know, you know, we have so many challenges around us, so many difficulties, human beings. You know, it's a miracle that we're born to walk with love on this planet. And dignity is um, is a miracle. Mm -hmm. It is. Life is a miracle. You know, and and you know, I'm so appreciative of you coming in you know everything's so divine like you said you know you're coming at the end on our episode 20 in 2020 uh we have more episodes do we have another episode after this i don't know we'll you'll check that yeah, out yeah we do this is, we do. <laughs> this is, this is not amazing done. because i've um i, I don't know we've, we've been able to kind of like see everyone else's eyes and you're kind of giving that that whole like omniscient type of eye where nothing that we know in our own perceptions are more sacred than others, though it still is very honorable within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, where we bring our collective consciousness together is this is this is what the forum is. You know, it's gonna be mm -hmm. some ebb and flows and all that stuff. Uh, you spoke about conflict and I think that, you know, it goes without saying this year about how things have been dealt and as far as conflict and lack of peace and you know a bunch of other stuff. So I think personally because everyone has had this time to take a step back they've been able to kind of recollect and maybe what may be open to, to more peace. So did you want to talk about um, how you got involved with that peace organ, your current peace organization between the yeah, US? Well, and I'm one of the founders of a group we're trying to do called New York, uh, New York City, New York's peace team. All right. Okay. That's what we were saying before. And it's basically to train everybody. You can take the classes. They're online. We started with from our connections with the DC peace team. Mm -hmm. We've been advocating for the last two or three years. The theme, the sub theme of the Buddhist council is um, a new culture of peace and love now. You know, we need to create a culture of peace. We need to have a the language of peace. We need to have mm -hmm. peace and clothing of peace. Things that, well, what I mean by that is conscious awareness of what we're doing. And so part of that journey is a new way of talking to each other. Mm -hmm. um, a way that doesn't mean that we scream at each other, but we communicate. It's nothing wrong with disagreement. Disagreement mm -hmm. can be a good thing. You know, one and one is never one. One and one is always two. You and I walk down the street and you say, hey, look at that flower over there. And I say, oh, look at that flower over there. You get to show me something I didn't know or see before. That's the magic of life. Not having a blow up doll that, yes, yes. And it just, <laughs> you know, and you don't have to dialogue. There's no resistance. There's no life. Yeah. Life is about resistance a lot. Mm -hmm. So what's your deal with the path of least resistance? No, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I hear that. I hear that completely. 
I, I, I wanted to ask this question before we, we got too out of it. Uh, Kaylee says, is a large part of Buddhism being a realist? Mm -hmm. I think it is. I think it is being a realist. That's why I said seeing things as they are. Too many times we fantasize about situations, circumstances. It doesn't mean when we say being a realist means being a pessimist because being a realist means, for example, I'll give you a real situation. My mother was transitioning from lung cancer. Hmm. My mother was, was terminally ill. She had lung cancer. And that's kind of a difficult situation, but it was quite beautiful. Because mm -hmm. I, got to, I got to hug Say my that part again? You went in and out. I said, I said it, was, it was quite beautiful because mm -hmm. I got to hug my mother. I got to mm -hmm. see my mother. I got to spend the last six months with my mother in a way I hadn't before. I got to see my father take care of my mother with the last bit of strength he had in his body. So that's wow. why he doesn't have memory, a memory now because it took every bit of his energy away. No way. And, I, you know, and so what I'm trying to say is, do I miss my mother? Of course. Was I sad that that happened? But Buddhism says, cherish this moment now. But there's beauty in taking care of someone right now. Mm. You know, so mm. my son, walking down the street, how does it work in real life? He says, "Why?" for a while he was having difficulty, so I'd walk him to school, I'd walk him to school. He's 15, he doesn't mean to walk him to school. Who wants to have that parent walk him to school? But then I said, he said, one day, I said, one day, you won't want me to walk you to school. I have a girl. Mm you have some other situation going on, you'll be with your boys, you won't want to do it. But right now, we can walk together. And so I come in, you might knock on the door later on, and knock on the door and say, Dad, I said, what's going on? He said, I just want to tell you I love you. So that's what comes from that seed of saying, I honor that moment. And so to go back to the question, that's mm -hmm. what a realist means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funny because when, when uh, Kaylee had said that originally I took it as that bottom line. I think sometimes people do think that realism is like, here's this hard truth. Sometimes it's it's a very soft, not truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, by the way, you know, here's a hundred dollars or whatever, or, you know, whatever. Um, because you sowed it, because you, like you said, you took care of something. You put some bread comes out for a bird. I mean, that's how Buddhism really uh, encapsulates the way we walk with life and how we we move through it and how we cherish each moment and i think that's matters like i think i think the realism sometimes can kind of be a little detriment so i appreciate you giving her the the, the receptive <laughs> interview i was just like i don't know kayla because i think it's, it's it's almost it's it's almost like as if um reality isn't what we know and that's where it goes back to your nirvana question um mm -hmm. earlier where it's like to be a realist is almost like you're bringing it to some sort of bottom line of your own perception Whereas the entire universe's perception ebbs and flows beyond your perception in and out <laughs> all the time, you know? So I, I think it's hard to be realistic in a world that sometimes feels so unreal, you know, <laughs> with some of the things we go through, you know? See, yes. oh, oh, sorry, but uh, just to add to that, Tyreek, I, I completely agree with you there. I, I think um, I, I see... As as someone who is a self proclaimed realist, um, <laughs> I, I will say I, I see realism being very construct, but also at the same time kind of fluid concept in, in term. I think there there are many forms of it, and I think what um, Professor Lynch is saying is, is a great mindset to have it and a great way to look at realism. But I think you are also fair at having your um, your kind of view and, and lens at looking at realism, because I think realism is something that could be either or. I think the way Kaylee is asking realism is is a great a great concept to to think about as well. But you know how I'm looking at it could be completely different compared to all three of you. And yet mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to, as as the show has gone on 20 episodes now, and as I've learned more things, I'm trying to look at it through all three lenses and then put it into a fourth lens for me to look at through each of you. And I and as I do that right now, as I speak, um, I, I look at realism and I look at Buddhism and I, I put the two together. I look at life and I see it being this, again, this very construct fluid thing. I see it as being something that is the bottom line, but at the same time, I see realism being something that can we truly believe it being there? Is it the thing, because sometimes there are moments of life, as Tyreek was saying, that just feels unreal. 
Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, two hours ago, I would have probably said, this does not feel like life is real right now. Just mm. with just hearing a piece of information, maybe not, doesn't seem real. Maybe, maybe right. two months ago, you experienced something that doesn't seem real, but here I am right now. This feels real. Being able to talk to you too, and being able to talk about this, this is real. Mm. I think, uh, sorry, I'm going on with my tangents, but, <laughs> but I feel that, uh, I feel that realism is something that is both real and yet could be unreal at the same time. Mm, right, and, and I think, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, Tyreek, I think you're real, at least in my head, you're real, but- You've never met me before. I could be an illusion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hologram. <laughs> 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 no, but yeah, Caleb, Caleb and I have actually never met in person. It's a joke we make. Mm -hmm. um, when we started this, we've become great friends uh, since August. But yeah, we often joke about how we've never physically, you know, seen each other before. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's very that's a very funny thing. I um I hear you. Yeah, I, I mean we can we can go into the, the thoughts of reality and you know dimensions well, and stuff. Say, for, we can keep going. I wanted, no, I wanted to let you know what, what Buddhism a lot of times. So if you went to different traditions in Buddhism, it actually that's the whole purpose of a lot of the processes through Buddhist meditation. So you'll sit down, you'll get peaceful, then you'll begin to access what does it mean to touch something. What does it mean to see something? What does it mean to taste something? And that's what a lot of the early Buddhist practitioners were actually doing mm -hmm. to test their reality against what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And the point that you find from that is, I'm more than my body. Mm -hmm. How about that? I'm more than my body or my experience. Now, I can tell you that, but that's like me telling you, okay, I'm eating this great uh, spaghetti dinner. Me eating the spaghetti dinner doesn't mean that you know what the taste is. You have to taste the spaghetti. You have to practice that. And then when you realize, once you get that insight, the Buddhism called, or maybe they call in Japan, Satori, that awakening, that you're more than your body, then all of a sudden everything changes, right? Wow. I'm more than yeah. my body, and I'm more than my thinking, then whatever. Right. It's a fundamentally different way of looking at your life. It's true. Or death. Or death. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Buddhism says five remembrances. These are five remembrances. I'm putting this out there so people hear this. Five remembrances that most Buddhists will um, make reference to, or many will. I'm of a nature to grow old. There's nothing I can do to stop old age. I'm of a nature to have ill health. Eventually, my body may have illness, right? I'm of a nature to die. No matter what I do, no matter how good I look, how much I exercise, I will transition. Four. I, no matter what I have, I will eventually lose all that I have. I will lose all that I have. And the mm -hmm. final one is, my actions are my only possession. If you mm -hmm. think about your life in that way, mm -hmm. it's become much different. The actions that you do with yourself and other people become dramatic. Yeah. 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 That, that, right. yeah. that hit home. Yeah, that last one. Your actions are what you take. That, that means a lot. It means a lot. Wow. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, obviously we know that there's no possessions, but it's, you know, I'm, even in the Christian religion, there are some sins of the mind and sins of the heart before it actually comes to the action. Mm -hmm. So that action could even be a thought, you know, a lot of people are just like, you know, I never shot this person. I never fought this person or whatever, but it's like you had such evil intent in your spirit and your being that alone will, is being created. You're creating this energy that needs to go somewhere. Absolutely. You know? And I always think, like you're saying, as Jesus said, what? As a man thinketh in his heart. So obviously. the first person who's harmed by the thoughts we think, and we know it from neurobiology, is ourselves. We create wow. reality. If we're angry at someone, the physiology of anger has to be created in ourselves before we say the word. The mm. first person who's poisoned is ourselves. Mm. So what you're saying is really important. Wow. Wow. Someone said, wow, the fourth one about losing everything. I think that was Imani. That one that one hit her a lot too. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I've, I guess I've never really been too into that. I've kind of been on the same wave with you. Like I never really worshiped a lot of celebrities. I was able to be in the entertainment industry kind of early. So I got to meet them kind of early. Like my dad had me meet Craig Mack a long time ago <laughs> as a baby, you know? Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think it's a combination of that, but I also think it's the spiritual journey that I was able to you know, go through with my life and still going on. Um, I don't know. I've never really been big on possessions or, or, or respect of persons and stuff. So that one, that one probably does mean a lot to people, you know, especially a success. You mentioned earlier about how you were an actor. 
and how success had meant a lot to you at some point. At what point, you know, and this is something I want to go back for all entrepreneurs in the room, you know, at what point do you feel like, okay, this success is not of my own merit or this success is not something I tangibly hold rather, you know, not to say that you aren't still acting now or whatever. Um, I'm sure there's still some Broadway stuff going on. But God is shit. <laughs> oh, <that's fine>. Thank God. <laughs> God, that's not happening. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there's definitely not. Um, yeah, I, I work at the Apollo Theater as well. I, hey, everything's my all. Own, all, my all own right around the corner from 135th Street. I'm a, lawyer, again? I'm a lawyer, I'm a recovering attorney. Um, and my law office is on 135th Street and 8th Avenue, of course. No of way. Way. So definitely let's go check them out there. I definitely yeah, go check them out. out. Two women run that office. So there. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, man, I mean, I, I think we've, we've touched on a lot of spiritual stuff and I feel like, uh, you know, on our religion series, that's what it is. But since we have you, we'd yeah. love to hear how you um, had moved through your entrepreneurship to get to where you are, combining the spirituality of what you've been doing. Um, there's some questions here that we'll throw up once Caleb comes back. Oh, I'll, I'll wait till he comes back. So yeah, man. How well, I think, you know, I, think that, I think that they kind of go hand in hand. I think what started happening for me I was working as an off-Broadway performer. I was just talking to my son earlier today. He's walking back again, coughing and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I was up for a film, a film where they were going to do a major film called Barfly. I was going to get a chance to be the lead actor. The lead actor ended up becoming Mickey Rourke. Um, wow. Ed, and um, I, uh, you know, I wanted to do that, but what was happening, I was trying to have, so many people were homeless in New York City. Mm -hmm. And women, and I saw men and women on the train homeless, eating out of garbage cans. I said, you know, I went to college, baby. I went to college. We should be able to do something about this, right? Go ahead. Um, and I saw so much corruption that was around and that was problematic. Uh, I started saying, um, what's this about? You know, I, I'm, I can win an Academy Award. I could win a Tony Award. So what? Hmm. Kind of it was, became so what? What is the purpose? As you go, your early question to me, what's the purpose of your life? Why did the infinite power of the universe give me life? Mm -hmm. I can't Tony War, but that's going to sit on a sit on the shelf, and people are going to say, "Oh, you were great! You were great!" I mean, I've I've been that person, you know. I know what that feels like. But at the end of the day, uh, I I didn't want to be the person who was constantly averting their eyes to other people suffering. Yeah. So part of the journey of being an entrepreneur is to see those eyes and find ways to cure that pain. That's what you're going to mm -hmm. get. And there's nothing wrong with getting paid for that. See right. what the pain is and cure the pain and you'll be paid. Whether it be in housing or art or, or merch, merchandise, right? Whatever it is, find where the pain is, cure that pain, and you'll be paid. It doesn't have to be me, me, me. There's a, it's great that, you know, I'm not saying that. You should, you, should, you should be lauded for your efforts. I'm not saying that you have to be, oh, shucks, that was just me. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, have have mid, you know, like a Midwestern, like all shucks type attitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious. curious. I know. I know. <laughs> He's the guy. He's the guy right now. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Right? You know, they don't want to accept that. That's part of, again, uh, self effacement, false humbleness. That's not what Buddhism is about. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, let's delve into that a little bit. Um, you know, as you as you go kind of like get into the more nitty gritty of what you've been doing. Um, entrepreneurial, like what was your first step? Like how'd you move from there? Oh yeah, um, well. What is, what is humility to you? And like how does that- it, really Yeah, humility you? means what I said to you at the very beginning. Recognize okay. that I've done nothing to create this pattern that the universe has given me this life. That I don't mm -hmm. stop the sun from being too close from the earth so that life can't exist or the moon being too close. I don't have any power over that. But all these functions in the universe, the earth, the, the, the wind, the rain, the sun, are acting in accordance, in a harmony so that I can have life. I didn't do anything for that. But I also have to respect that the universe did the same for you. And therefore, the potential inside of you is the potential of the universe acting through you. It's a powerful, different way of looking at it. Ooh. That was a good one. <laughs> we, we're actually going to have a highlight <laughs> reel, and I think you just made it. No, I'm joking. That's amazing. I mean, say that oh, for the people in the back. I've oh, my God. everything. <laughs> <laughs> say, that, say that last quote again. I'm I, don't even know. I was actually saying it from my heart, so I wasn't Spirit, saying, it like, right, that's that's I'm not saying it like from pre-program, but I'm that's really... It, so you guys rewind that, but that was, that, was, that was phenomenal. That was a big one right there. 
Oh mm-hmm. man, that's that's so. so the entrepreneur's goal is to realize what they can do for the environment, add value. Where will he or she or they add value? And value, be a value creator. And if you're a value creator, you won't be destroying the environment. You won't be destroying your neighborhood. You won't be selling your community drugs. You'll be finding ways to empower the people because of what I just said. They too are the power of the universe in action. Mm-hmm. Be part of that harmonious interaction. It's a fundamentally mm-hmm. different way of looking at your life and other people's lives, as opposed to I got mine, you get yours. I'm <laughs> you get yours, baby. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Right? I, I graduated. So I was number one. I was valedictorian. Now, what you going to do? It's a different attitude. Definitely a different attitude. I mean, you're, you're coming from capitalism and going into a whole different world right there. You know, I think a lot of this is ingrained in our economy and the way we've been living. And you did speak about slavery and stuff as well. Um, yeah, a lot of this is just like so anti-Buddhist. And that's why I think <laughs> I think someone had asked the question. They were like, with anti-Blackness popular, uh, if you want to bring that up, Caleb, I think it's, yeah, there you go. Yeah. You want to read it for him? Yeah, I can. With anti-blackness popular in all cultures, did you face any challenges with your conversion? I think that um, I think there was a lot of challenges for a lot of black mm-hmm. blues. A lot of challenges. I, I think that you know part of that the goal has to be to walk the path, and to walk the path means to you have to decide how you're going to treat other people and you just treat yourself. I always had this little phrase: "You don't have enough power over me." For me to treat you poorly. You can't make me treat you poorly. Mm-hmm. That's be my decision. And so uh, I don't let other people determine how my value is going to be uh, set in that way. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, that's real. Yeah, that's that's absolutely beautiful. And it actually segues away into another great question that Amani asked us. And that is, what has been your most difficult challenge in your journey as a Buddhist? Um, to get over my uh, own weaknesses, mm-hmm. my own predilections, my own um, things that I, my own notions, like we said before, Nirvana, Nirvana is getting rid of your notions, getting rid of my notions so that I'm in a position to be more loving for real, to be more compassionate for real, to be more mm-hmm. for real. That's hard to do because it's easy to say until someone says, uh, they jump in front of you on the line or they disrespect you or... Uh, they say things in a way that may be racialist or hurtful or harmful. How do you dig inside of yourself so that you can be compassionate regardless of the circumstance? Of the mm-hmm. That's the key thing. That's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Let, let, <laughs> my, my grandmother would say, you need to let go and let God. <laughs> let go. Indeed. Indeed. That is... Know. Man, I, I tell you, I've I've written down like everything that you said <laughs> because it's it's been it's just been it's been beautiful, it's been wise, it's just been brilliant at that. And um, I already had a, a notebook ready because I knew I knew it was going to be that way. Um, I could just tell. I just had that feeling in my gut. Um, and it's, I think what you what you said right there is is just beautiful. And I, and I love I love how connected um, just everything that you've said. I know you said it's just kind of been off your head, but some of the things that you said, it has truly just been so connected with Mm -hmm. everything that this show is rooted on. And, and that's, you know, identity. And, and we have this whole full circle thing that we always, we kind of joke about, but it's the truth. And I think Tyreek and I have recently noticed in the past few episodes that it's the absolute truth that this full circle thing of identity continues to come back and comes, continues to be this full circle thing. And I think it's, I think it's the fact that it's, it's the truth. It's, it's the reality, this realism talk. Um, it's, it's this constant, uh, ebb and flow type of thing that, that mm-hmm. is, um, that's occurring throughout us and then that's occurring throughout our lives and and life itself is beautiful and I, that's something that um, I definitely over the past few years you know for my identity have connected more to Buddhism than any other um, type of religion or spirituality in, in general I, I, I definitely am not a Buddhist, but I have always uh, considered myself looking more into the views, into the lens of Buddhism than anything else. 
And so this that's kind of why this episode is I'm so excited for and the next as well, um, because I, I've been able to really see uh, myself in it more more than anything. And it's it's great to know that there are there are aspects of life that um, I try to live by on the daily on that the hourly, you know, by each second <laughs> being able um, to to live that way. Yeah. How, how would how would someone come to the Buddhist religion? Like, how does that, how does that yeah. work? Like, if Caleb wanted to convert. Ways of doing it. You know, uh, in the, the Tibetan tradition, the Dalai Lama, you go and pick, you go to a group and they have a Lama that you sort of interview and they interview you. And, and my, in other traditions, uh, I call them as two strains, the heritage tradition that everybody thinks like the Dalai Lama and the convert community, which is sort mm. of because I'm an African-American studying Japanese Buddhism. You come to my Dharma Center, uh, we tend to be obviously a more Western integrated Buddhist concept. In other words, people come in their jeans and they talk just like a lot of other Buddhist places. But um, you, I think, and I, I was listening to, to what uh, Caleb was saying, I wanted to say this, you know, labels don't matter. Your life matters. And so once you take your life seriously, that's Buddhism. Hmm. You you could be a Christian if you say I'm going to love one another as as Jesus told me to love people. Mm -hmm. That's Buddhism. If you say I'm going to be a righteous man or woman as Allah has required me to be, that's Buddhism. Hmm. You know, it's not about putting on the spe you know, I have my little thing here. My, yeah, my yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? But it doesn't mean, you know, it's not about the sash, it's not about the robe, it's not about I'm shaving your head. It's not about all that. It's about being alive. And so that's Buddhism. So that's why I can say the process of Buddhism is enveloping and and embracing everyone's path. Everyone's path. So that's how you start. You take your path. Doesn't mean discard your path. Whatever path you've been on, you embrace that for real. And say, well, I want to learn a bit more about meditation, right? I want to learn. Mm -hmm. Professor Lynch was talking about knowing what your your feelings are and your emotions and your thinking i'm more than how is that how is my thinking different from i I'm, how could that be possible how am i more than my thinking that sounds crazy is this man crazy then when you find i'm not crazy that's part of the buddhist path hmm. you know it's not about going to some special place so that's important i think you know I, i'm not here to convert people i'm here to make sure people get happy there's a difference difference regardless of where it is i can see uh, i've chased i chased uh away, <laughs> chased well, away. That's, <laughs> well that's beautiful honestly um i think Derek is back <laughs> How about that <laughs> it's been very weird today uh yeah. oh man i i did i did want to dive a little deeper into this um you know, just well, your professionalism. Oh, did you have a question before I came on? I'm sorry. Not, not a question, but a point to the last thing that uh, sure. Professor Lynch did say real quick. But before you, uh, we dig deeper, even deeper than we've already been. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would I would like to say, you know, you said you're here um, to bring happiness and, yeah. and to help people be happy and everything. And that mm. that right there, I think you, you've said amazing things of this show. That right there, I think, resonated with me the most and, and might have been one of the greatest things I think I've ever heard, um, to be honest. And it was so simple. But that's what I loved about it. It was so simple because you said, you know, I'm not here to con help you convert. I'm not here to necessarily even say, hey, you should be a Buddhist. You, you are saying or, or even like, hey, Buddhism, you are saying, I just want happiness. That's mm -hmm. all I want. Very important. That's the key point because I can say this is a promise in the, the sutra that I chant is the Lotus Sutra. Mm -hmm. And in the Lotus Sutra, it says anybody who hears the words that I speak from the spirit I'm speaking from the Lotus Sutra is guaranteed to become a Buddha. <laughs> to become a Buddha. Just mm -hmm. by hearing what I said. And so the whole purpose is not to have people study the Lotus Sutra. The whole purpose of Buddhism, the way I practice it, is to liberate people from suffering so that they're happy. Mm -hmm. Or may all living beings be happy and free from suffering. That's what Buddhists say. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, 
May all living beings be free from fear, worry, doubt, and suffering. These are things that Buddhists say, all living beings, any other living beings on other planets. That means plants, that means trees. I can't exploit the environment. It's very natural. It's not like I gotta, I gotta, we gotta go march now and you know, I'm I'm gonna save foam cups. <laughs> sandals, you know, made from tree barks that fall. <laughs> you know. You know, to, to be alive and to be aware means to say, okay, I have a responsibility to make sure everything is happy mm -hmm. and I have the power to do it. That's another thing. It's one thing to talk chat, 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 but it's another thing to believe you have the power and to know you have the power to change things. A mm -hmm. big difference. Yes, yes, it is. You know, it's, it's where Caleb was, where he's at as well. That's kind of where I got gotten to feeling very powerless um to change those things and i wanted to kind of go back to what you were saying just walking through new york city and and seeing the poverty in such a significant way uh seeing homelessness in a significant way and having being blessed with privilege you know but also having you know people in your family that i'm sure it was going through similar things as well <laughs> say it again I said, keep it real yes yes, yes. listen i mean yeah, i know yeah. it's, it's, it's harder when it hits home and like you said when they look like you and their spirit you can hear their spirit crying out for something more you know, um, let alone just the food or, you know, whatever it is. They want guidance, you know, they want help, they want support. And as a community, we are supposed to be here for that. So, um, yeah, I've often felt very powerless in that. And I think that with the inception of this podcast and some other things that I've done with my life, I have found more power in what we're doing. Um, and the sense of that, I and it's, it's this balance between humility and, and powerlessness, I'm guessing. You know, um, it's okay to be humble and be like, well, you know, I'm just a little old, like you said, just little old me, little old Buddhist me, you know, I, 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 I hand out those little tickets on 42nd Street. I let people know I'm just the perfect monk, but you haven't helped a soul. And that's, that's just not how it works, you know, and you could be, you know, you could be a Muslim and, you know, still achieve that nirvana state if you find a way to communicate um, in the right way and just be spiritual. So, um, yeah, that power, it's difficult sometimes to feel powerful. Um, and I think that's why I've been drawn to the Buddhist uh, religion as well, uh, as far as research and stuff, because mm -hmm. it really puts, it, it gives you that zero that the other religions don't, I realize, mm. that center um, between the two, um, I would say, as far as Christianity is concerned, where I feel like the allegorical and the metaphysical kind of puts you in a very like emotional, spiritual space, which you have to learn very well, which is because he was trained in it generationally, two, three generations of, four generations of people, of uh, ministers, he has it in him. So now he can take that knowledge, Professor James Lewis, and take it to Buddhism and train with Shaolin monks and, you know, learn how to stand on his head and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I say a lot to say, you know, I think, I think um, a lot of like, even like when you watch old samurai movies and old Asian movies that have these more Zen or uh, Shinto aspects, um, you always hear about how this power within somehow becomes so much greater without. And, and, once you're without, then you realize that you're not even here within your own body as well. So it's like this cyclical thing that he was saying. It's very cyclical. But I, I wanted to comment on what you're saying, Caleb. I know we often say that it's full circle with, with identity, but I'm actually, you know, just hearing the way Professor James Lynch is thinking about it, it's very much a spiral, I feel like. And I feel like eventually you're just going to get to the Ooh. center of being. And then once you get to the center of being, you're opening up into a whole nother world. And I think that's what death or quote unquote is, um, uh, the reincarnation process. And I think it is cyclical. But what makes it more sacred is the fact that it's new. You know, like in a spiral, there's always that little edge out before the next one. So we're, we are living it, but it's like the rings of a tree. You know, it, you start from the center, you start from that little acorn, you know, and, and you work out and you somehow become an oak tree to give more fruit to others. And I think that's mm -hmm. very Siddhartha because he was under the tree and all stuff. I didn't even mean to make that reference. But yes, very much like Sid himself. <laughs> Yo, no, uh, just so you know, I never say this, I rarely say this. My, that was my mother's metaphor for Buddhism and time, which she said, it's not linear, but a spiral. She did just, so I want you to know that. So I, again, you may say, but in Buddhism, we don't call that my mother's phrase. There's no such thing as coincidence in the universe. The fact that you would use something that I've never heard anybody, and I go to many, 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 Buddhist um, treats and discussions, hundreds of Buddhists. I listen to Buddhist lectures from the Dalai Lama, and you're the only person I have <laughs> ever 
saying this. Not even. I appreciate that. I'm, <laughs> now I'm feeling my weird. No, no, no. I, okay. I don't, so I want you to know that Ooh. was her metaphor for how Buddhism re-expresses time. Yes. She's mm. like a spiral. That's why you can impact the past or the future. We think of things as linear, but it's really acting in a spiral. So the people sort of, uh, I didn't understand it quite right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, wish I, I wish I could say I came up with the idea, but my dad taught me. Isn't that powerful? Me. That's a powerful. Universal truth, right? That's how it is. He definitely taught me that one. Yeah, and it did. It started off with time. It started off with how we live our yeah. lives. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give your dad. Kind of like. <laughs> Got to give him some love. Got to give him some love. Yeah, I will. I will. I will tell him. You know, obviously, I've conceptualized it a lot better, and, I've, and that's mm -hmm. why I'm able to kind of talk to you about it. But yeah, I, I had no idea. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea. You know, because some people even feel that within lifetimes, and like your mother is a spiral of you. Oh, you no, know, and then it just keeps going into you know your son and you know and so on. If, if you look behind me, you can see that's the eternal Buddha, and my okay. mother. My, this was my mother's altar at one time. Mm. So my mother, remember I told you she had transitioned from cancer. This was her sacred area, and so I've maintained that, and I became a Dharma teacher, uh, building from where my mother was. Wow. So, you know, that's that's how. So when you see behind me. Even though I, I always that's behind me, it, mm. how to maintain the humbleness. I'm I'm a spokesperson, not for me. I'm supposed to be a spokesperson for the Buddha, right? Mm. Supposed to touch your heart so that you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they, they said in Christian religion as well, or like you know, we're spoken for Jesus, or we're spoken, for, but whatever that ideal is, you know, that's that's what we become, <laughs> and that's the ideal humanity. Just like we were able to say such universal truths over time and space. Like your mom probably told you that way before I was born or something, you know? <laughs> uh, so I can only imagine, you know, that these things are all coming, like, you know, it's, it's beautiful, man. And, and uh, I get, what you just described to me kind of brings me into some more Orisha traditions of ancestry and in, in creating, you know, that lineage behind you. And I think that a lot of African spirituality has explained a lot of this aspect of having you know, this this army of spiritual guidance behind us, you know, and and that's something that, you know, Caleb, I know he's like, yeah, whoa, you know, you have a long line of history as well, which comes from, from a whole bunch of stuff. And that's why I always go so hard about making sure you know where you come from and where that means and where they, it has a lot to do with where you're going sometimes. Um, did you do you want to say something, Professor Lynch? Or? No, I was actually nodding my head because one of the key things that's controversial sometimes in my Buddhist tradition, which I think resonates very well with African tradition, is ancestor veneration. Mm -hmm. So every day, um, every day at, in our prayers, at the end of our prayers, we'll say something to this effect. I just basically it says to the effect something like, um, it's transfer and medicine. Um, the spirits of all our ancestors and all spirits recorded on a memorial register, which was what you saw behind me, all mm -hmm. memorial days today and all spirits everywhere known and unknown to us. So the idea is to venerate and to recognize that there's a power that you're ancestors have given you that is manifesting in your life today, which is, I think, resonates very well with tradition African religions, mm -hmm. understanding of the universe and continuity. And it also resonates very well with traditional, even European uh, understandings of the religions. Mm -hmm. So until we had what I call a modern um, Christianity, not necessarily because in Ethiopian Christianity is a little different about ancestor understanding mm -hmm. Christianity of how we understand it today. So that's an important point. That's what I wanted to say. I was not in my head saying that, why that's important. That was important for me as a mm -hmm. practitioner that I can articulate what I just said. That I didn't have to, I have to discard and say, call that some kind of uh, weird primitivism is what the West would often call it as a religious studies major, or animist worship or something else like that. Right, right, right. It has deeper meanings um, as a Buddhist now. And I can call yeah. it uh, forces within me that are continuations of my ancestors. Indeed, indeed. Today. Very powerful, actually. It's That's very beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Very so I guess um, I guess the other thing I wanted to kind of go into, because um, I do, I really, I don't know if you feel comfortable, but I do really want to know and kind of explain to people like how you just made this, you know, significant journey. Just like you're sitting on so many boards, you're talking about the UN. Like I really want to get into, I know you hate accolades. I, I, I'd rather talk the spiritual stuff, but we have to, we have to give them some of that stuff as well, just so that people can know that there is, there is some more tangible stuff that can be done as well. You know what I mean? And I, to, yeah. to that point, to that point, before I'll let you get your thoughts about that. 
I was curious, since we are talking about African spirituality and stuff, how um, important it is to have a place or a sanctuary or a shrine. What do you think about that? I, th I think that the sanctuary or shrine is a reminder of the sacredness of the path of where you go. Mm -hmm. Having the shrine or the sacred place reminds you that what I'm thinking may be crazy. I need to touch into the level of the spirituality that's around me. And how can I take this spirituality along the person who's the cab driver, he or she may be treating me poorly or my boss or my significant other or my relationships. They're not giving me the love I want or I want more love or I want less love, whatever it is. I have to take that. So that the sanctuary really is an opportunity to pause and reflect and correct our thinking, mm -hmm. our life. So that's in harmony with our deepest value. Right. And so that's what it does. But there's no magic you know, it's like like like, like I close the I, I'll get off the podcast and like flowers will float down. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it was a good podcast because you know the roses hit the ground. <laughs> it's not like some other people maybe, but not me. I don't have that happen. You know, I have that opportunity. <laughs> but I think that it does. There is no question about it. Yeah, we're connected in ways we don't even understand to a universe. A um, famous Buddhist monk named Nichiren Daishonin said in about 1262, he said, you can't see your own eyebrows without a mirror. Hmm. You can't see something so personal to yourself without a mirror. Wow. We don't know what's happening to us. And the sanctuary should be your mirror to reveal your sacredness. Hmm. So it's not going to be just like, I, I bought some crystals here. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you right. Do, but if you do just that, then you are, you're, you're, you're cheating yourself. Mm -hmm. Cheating yourself. Right. 15 minutes anyway, have 15 minutes where you begin to say, wow, I'm part of the whole universe and what matters. Right. I'm, powerful. I'm the primary cause. I cause what happens in the world for me. Right. Yeah. right. And that's important for an entrepreneur to understand that. Right. Yeah. Right. If you wanted to transcend into, into right. that. But yeah, that's 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 so true because it does sometimes become very tangible. And I think if you're operating your body <laughs> as just your body, you're gonna be a little lost regardless, especially when it comes to spirituality. Your mind can enter certain spaces, your body can enter certain spaces that spirit will. And I, I never thought, yeah, I know like some people think the shrines, you know, a lot of spirituality is coming out and I'm, I'm very excited, you know, about the transition, you know, spiritually with the cosmos and everything that's going on. But a lot of it is genuine truth. And I think a lot of what's been gonna come through is the truth of the matter, <laughs> you know? And I think kind of goes back to that idea of what Caleb brought about uh, realness mm -hmm. in the sense of that, that truth is probably gonna be totally different than you ever thought. And like you said, mm -hmm. we become so comfortable with where our face is, but what if one day it just wasn't there? <laughs> you'd be, you wouldn't know, you'd be none the wiser, you know, uh, Emperor's new clothes for sure. So I think, um, yeah, it definitely gets you out of that space of being like, okay, I know I, my known knowns will always be there. My constants will always be there. My mom will always be there. My dad will always be there. You know, uh, these things seem to be three dimensional. You know, these crystals were always going to charge me up. Let me make sure I put them in the sun. You know, not that I, I, I'm very big with minerals and crystals as well, because they, they hold a vibrational frequency, but it's all about the practitioner. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of this, you know, what we, what, what we try to promote in our identity podcast is finding out what your identity is and i think professor uh professor lynch is really explaining like everything he said is his own life and his own journey and the things that he's worked it but it can be applied to everyone but it is still up to you to seek your own knowledge and truth in order to get to your purpose and there's nobody that can tell you that you know so but i am curious how did you get to the UN, man? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm curious, well, you know, even with our podcast, we want to start to connect yeah, with other I, 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 communities. It's, it's fortuitous. I, again, my mother would say there's no coincidence in the universe, and I believe that. I belong to the Risha Kosakai organization. They mm -hmm. were big on the UN and the idea of working for other people around the world and making sure that we have a place where people can dialogue peacefully. Right. Religion, because religion frequently is at odds. There's frequently violence associated with religion. You know, we try to hide from that, but there is. So in order, in order to stop that, we have to discuss what's happening for real, right? And so that's what Rishi Kosakai was about. And I'm fortunate, you know, I was, I'm was i not in Indiana. I'm in New York City. And um, uh, they said, because of my skill set, I had been an attorney, as I said, recovering. They mm -hmm. said, someone who has your skill set, the minister who was there, Reverend Fujita, a Japanese minister who was here, couldn't speak English, <laughs> like me, and she said, we, I want you to be the official representative 
for New York for wow. guy to the UN. And um, so I have my little UN badge in my bag, uh, which hasn't happened because of the pandemic recently, but I was very privileged to do that. And I've seen a lot of things, you know, about where the world's going, hmm. you know, um, water rights and all those types of things. Uh, the development of mega mm-hmm. cities, which is on the plans for the UN, things that people don't know about. And so I'm very privileged to be involved in that. And then from that, um, I worked on um, uh, making sure that with the recent Black Lives Matter, with the idea of working with religious groups so that we can stop uh, violence of the police and also people attacking the police. We wanted to make sure there was balance. So I was in religious communities with regards to that interfaith kind mm-hmm. of how can we do that and change, you know, I call it reimagine the police because a lot of times in New York City, you know, black communities, yeah. we police. <laughs> you know, you get knocked in the head. Yeah. You call somebody, you don't want to. Yeah. Cal- California is probably the only one that kind of got that. <laughs> got, it, got it similar. But yeah. yeah. So that's what it did. And so a lot of the things that I've been doing have been an outgrowth of that. So that's what the world problem in religion. I was just uh, picked as a trustee for that in the last two or three months. Mm-hmm. And then, um, uh, then the Buddhist Council of New York. I was the representative, so therefore, well, after that, that was awesome. Is is the, I saw a note, and it might have been from Caleb's notes. Uh, there's someone named T.K. Nagasaki. T.K. Nagagaki. Tiki Nagagaki. 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 Okay. Yes, I helped him start a group called the Haywood Peace and Reconciliation Foundation, which is doing tremendous work. Well, it's probably you know you have a lot of think tanks for war. It's probably one of the few think tanks for peace in the country. Wow. Um, he's been That's involved. Awesome. In- yeah, Hiroshi and Nagasaki memorials. Um, we've been doing things with that. I've been working with him with regards to that. He's a monk, um, full time. Wow. And so I've been working with him. He was the former president of the uh, Buddhist Council of New York. So I'm the first lay practitioner of the Buddhist Council in New York, probably in 35 years. No way. Black wow. person too. So it was kind of a new. Wow. So I got to stay, um, I don't want to say humble, but I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that. The vast majority of the Buddhist council is Asian. 85, 90% are Asian. So people asked me earlier, I represent 85, 85, 90% Asian. Uh, and those are about 800 or 900,000 people in the New York City area. And that mm-hmm. low end. And the convert community, people like myself, African Americans, white Buddhists, maybe represent 30, 50,000. Wow. <laughs> wow. So it's not the same. So how, how do you have the voice to speak? from some people that have come from such a far distant place. Well, I think that that's, that's, that's a real concern for me. Interesting. Real okay. Me. I see the thing. I'm hmm. very concerned as an African American. I don't like when people pretend to speak for me. I think it's problematic. And I think that's one of the problems we have now. People can usurp our words, usurp our identities, this pocket. Identity. Appropriation. <laughs> Appropriation use it for their own even you utilizing us as fronts for that activity. Hmm. So very, very vocal, trying to speak out in areas where I felt it need to be done. For example, when a lot of people were not talking about Asians were being attacked, people didn't know this, people were being attacked after President Trump had made the statement that uh, it was the China flu. <laughs> Whether you agree, whatever you disagree, but there were Asians being attacked, physically. Hmm. Uh, and um, I went to the city of New York and I, got a commitment from them to change. And eventually, by course, the Buddhist Council and other groups put pressure on them, other Asian groups put pressure on, not just us. Um, we got a special task force for Asian violence. Wow. So that was important. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So in the Asian community, a lot of times they would suffer in silence. That's what I was going to get at. That's exactly uh, what I was going to say. So they felt maybe for this interim, maybe now they're getting the, the lion wants to roar. So maybe I won't be the president of the Buddhist Council the next time. But so this time, as I said, is sacred for me. Let me do what's, that. What's the terms for it? How does it work? Is, uh, there, so is there like a high council that you have to go talk to or something? Much. Or? It sounds weird to say that. It's about two years. Um, we don't have like, you know, it's not like election. <laughs> not like an election we have now. Like people come to each other and change. Let's, let's stuff the ballot box. Usually it's pretty much unanimous. Um, you know, um, I, I don't want to say what sometimes the challenge is because certain Buddhist groups can't talk to other Buddhist groups because of the political ramifications that the society has implemented, but behind the scenes, we're working very, very closely together. Mm. And I think mm. uh, people thought I was a kind person. I'm just being honest with you. They thought I was a kind person and they knew I was very respectful of the monastic tradition, um, but also I'm a lay practitioner. So I'm 
wearing both hats. We need to move forward. We need to be in the world, but we need to respect the monastic tradition, which is protecting the purity of the, the teachings. We need to have of those two things going forward. And I hope if they were to hear this, I hope that they would say I'm respectful of those two objectives, you know, mm. um, going forward. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, but that's part of it. Isn't that the good thing? Amen. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. I mean, how many people have start, started the Legion of Peace, man? <laughs> so a lot of Legions of Doom. There's a lot of that going on, <laughs> doom and gloom going on. So that's that's wonderful. You know, I, I appreciate your humility and your honesty with that. I, I was more curious, you know, and I, I feel like I've had I've had a lot of situations where I've had to interact with the Asian community, even in Japan. Uh, when I first went out there, Obama was just president and my hair wasn't dreads yet. And they called me Obama-san and it was hilarious. Everybody thought it was so funny. But um, so I think, um, yeah, sometimes I did have some some real, there's some real intrinsic not talking about our pain, you know, that I connected with, that I saw in my grandparents, that I saw in the Asian community as well. It's something about the suffering and silence that just needs to be done away with. And I think that it's it's prevalent to a lot of different communities. And also, you said something else about the decentralization of um, politics and religion, almost, in the sense of, you know, obviously we have to get certain things done because of monetary stuff or support, you know, through the politics. But because you guys were able to kind of separate from the politics of it, like you said, in quiet, you can become one full Buddhist community rather than like these separate sects that get certain amount of money or allocation and jurisdiction and all these tangible things that we deal with. So, and I also think they put you there because at the end of the day, you know, as much as tradition is there, things do die off and, and the future of it may be more converts. So it might be a situation mm -hmm. where because you're in between, you can be more comfortable for that much smaller percentage of people that don't feel comfortable because, you know, they may not bond on something that may be intrinsically from Asia. Because even in Asian cultures, some Koreans don't like certain Chinese and some Chinese don't like certain Japanese. And I know that for a fact. So, you know, going back to the religious, I mean, the, the persecution, which seemed almost like how it was during World War II, again, with all the Asian community. Um, you know, I, I noticed it very significant in New York because I had some, you know, Asian friends that were really getting a lot of slack and, and, and you know, almost feeling like as if they were, you know, ill. You know, and I think I think that on top of like, you know, I, I, I don't know, this apples and oranges, right? When we talk about racial uh, intolerance, but, you know, it, it's almost like I can get on an elevator. Um, this is in the past, of course, you get on an elevator and someone clutches their purse. It's different than you get on an elevator and someone covers himself with an entire mask and, and hazmat suit. You know, it, there's something that does something to your psyche. And I think that it's it's been very prevalent. And it's all over the place. And I think a lot of people have moved. A lot of people have shifted from New York because of a lot of stuff that's been going on like that. So definitely thanks for bringing, you know, um, awareness to that. And that's why you're here, you know, uh, regardless of what walk of life, you know, that's something that we we haven't spoken about on our podcast. And it's often not something spoken about. So I do appreciate you saying that yes. for sure. Very important. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we reached on our mark. I don't want to hold you too much longer. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about your professional projects, um, but I think the tidbit that you said to kind of get people inspired um, is finding that gap, finding that gap in, in your own life and where you can start to help that. You saw mm -hmm. this very prevalent big thing of homelessness. And in, I guess in New York, it's on a, it's on one of those 42nd Street TVs, you know, because it's so prevalent. But, you know, you get that call. And when you respond to that call is then when you're able to fill that with some sort of business or something so i guess for me i'm curious about someone that's trying to pursue a fully spiritual uh space because like you said in your past you were kind of a lawyer um and you had something that was um a little more traditionally you know ready to whatever i think you said recovering lawyer which is very funny because every time you say it, it sounds like you're recovering uh you know from something terrible though i do think law has its own caveats for sure but um uh, I, won't, I won't go be so long-winded, but I, th I think it's um, I think it's just it's interesting to see where you are now and like how to become like I know some people that you know before this big pandemic were like, hey, I'm gonna be a masseuse. Hey, I'm gonna just do spirituality. Hey, I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna figure out how the universe is gonna you know figure it out. And um, you know, 2020 hit and they're just like, well, we need food and water and stuff, you know, and you just think about the water wars and I do think that is a huge global thing that no one's talking about, you know, who owns waterways and a bunch of other stuff. So we'll definitely keep that for a new episode, maybe when we bring you back for sure. 
Um, but yeah, I'm. I said a whole lot. Did you have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, the quick answer to that, and it's very simple, is this. You know, for example, if we if we're reflecting on our lives, then our lives will lead us a path of commitment. Doesn't matter. You could be a masseuse. You could be anything. You could be, you know, how we serve. The question isn't whether we're going to live or die. The question in between is how we're going to serve. How we're going to serve. It could be this podcast. It could be cleaning toilets. It could be president of the United States. The question in between is how you're going to serve. And if you remember that, then that'll keep you on point. So why did I become an attorney? I became an attorney because there was so much corruption in the city of New York and Philadelphia. People kept asking for bribes. Wow. And I said, this is insane. I got to become an attorney so I can fight this. Hmm. That's crazy. Simple as that. And, um, you know, I worked in very large law firms, the largest international law firms, because I said to them, I want to connect your banks to community based organizations like my own who were not getting money. I worked at the law firms and you know what they want to do? They don't want to do that. <laughs> They're not interested in that. That's their to make money. And I don't have any problem with the honest, you know, they like, okay, brother, that's on you. <laughs> that's your fair, that's your spare time. Right, and, right. So then I left those big firms worked as a community lawyer with a guy in Brooklyn, my good friend, Arthur Edwards um, in Brooklyn. And um, great, great attorney, by the way, anybody who needs one, Arthur Edwards, yeah. uh, my man, give him a shout out. Um, and then um, eventually I was working at my own law firm up in Harlem. And then I um, represented hundreds of small businesses at that time, up in Harlem, hundreds of them. So men and women begging for work at work job sites, uh, begging for jobs as the neighborhood was being gentrified, people begging literally at the thing, people begging in the street for work, not for money, for work. They wanted to work and they were being isolated from their own community. Money's not given to them to revitalize their community. And so then I had the opportunity, again, no coincidence, to become a teacher. And uh, I became a teacher and uh, now I'm a chairman again. I didn't want to be the chairperson. And they said, no, James, we want you to be the chairperson of the department. Yeah. No, I don't want to be the chairperson of the department. This is too crazy. They said, no, no, we've already put your name up. Now, if you win, you'll take it. <laughs> and that's how I became chairman. So why am I saying is um, it's, it's, our life is sort of like that. We have this yeah. idea, the straight trajectory or something like that. But a lot of times it takes us in ebbs and flows. And um, you just have to be, stay committed and reflect on yourself. How am I serving? Who am I serving and how am I serving? You have to serve yourself. Sounds weird for me to say that, but you have mm -hmm. to honor the sacredness of your own life. You're not, you're not here to be a martyr. You know, right. you're not here to be a martyr. How are you serving yourself and how are you serving others? It works together in harmony. Right. You work in harmony, you get strong, not weaker. Right. We take from you, you feel it. You feel when you have fair people, they, they feel like a vampire. They you start going, mm -hmm. up. <laughs> you know? When a person's giving to you, you say, Whoa, I feel good. I'm glad I spoke to that person. I feel stronger today. Right, right, right. That's when you find not everybody is right for you at every moment of your time. You got to find mm -hmm. the right people around you who are going to nurture your heart and mind, nurture your love. Wow. Your Harmony. Um, it's very, I think that was, that's a big thing. When you went to Japan, you'll see it. I, I was taught by, when I was in Japan, one of the lessons I learned, I was doing the tea ceremony and I was trained by a tea ceremony master. She was a master of the tea ceremony. And so many different steps just before they give you a cup of tea, mm -hmm. you know, and um, wow. being grateful of that changed my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Changed my life. Because that's not how Americans organize themselves. We got a, we've got objectives. We've got goals. We're going <laughs> to make it happen. Man, I can't wait to have the fly car and the fly. Car. I'm flying. Right. You know, people right. come and say that. Well, who are you? I'm listed, man. I'm listed. You know, <laughs> you know, you're living in your own world at that point, right? Right, right, right. That's so funny, man. Right? So many people who achieve that level of what we consider outstanding success mm -hmm. collapse because it's not, as the Bible would say, on a firm foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. foundation. Yes. To make your life, the Bible says, Jesus, build your house upon a rock. Hmm. 
unshakable. That's what That's he said. Amazing. Yeah. It's all because of those the, the rock that you had. Like it, it sounds like to get to the lawyer aspect is because you already had this spirit within you, you know, this this being within you, whether it had been passed from your mother and your father or just, you know, what you are what you were ordained to do. Um and ironic ironic with that word ordain, it's funny that that the very, very Buddhist way to describe how you got to uh, cha- uh, chairman. It's like, yeah, the people voted for me. I was actually <laughs> asleep somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I was meditating, thinking about the universe. And somebody was like, hey, we need you to go do something. And I was like, yeah, I'll appear, you know? Um, but that's awesome, man. And I, I appreciate that because we do, we have approached it in a couple of different ways. And I do think that maybe that is why people fail so much is because there is no A to B. And unfortunately, the only way to progress is to work on yourself. And people would rather just be like, can I just get a degree in this? Or can I just <laughs> become a master in tea so that we can just go straight to heaven or whatever? You know, but um, yeah, I think, I think I, I appreciate that. It's definitely an ebb and flow. And if you are watching this and you're at one of your low points, best believe you won't be there forever. And if you're at your top point, be ready for the valley, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, the only other note I guess I was trying to hint at is uh, because he works for Brooklyn College and, you know, uh, Professor James Simpson also knows a lot of, yeah, so shout out to uh, BC for sure. Uh, yeah, um, Imani is also from BC. So we appreciate her for inviting you um, and also how you guys met as well. But I, um, I, I guess I'm just like, I'm curious to see like, why people have their pitfalls you know I, I guess in my mind when you said there's a lot of people begging for work you saw the outside you know outside pressures so you were like all right we're gonna tackle the judicial system and you were like Oof, that's <laughs> a very difficult way to go so then god led you to the spiritual thing and you've been doing so much more so I like I, like you said it's steps and i think like you said if somebody wanted to become chairman or that was their goal they may not have stayed there forever, you know, but because you were able to create all of these like uh, terraces of sorts, uh, each, each place you stepped was solid. And then you was able to grow from there and then you was able to grow from there. And then somebody was able to reach a hand down and pull you out from there, you know, stuff like that. But you always have your own firm footing. And I think that is probably what would be the best entrepreneurial aspect to is find your firm footing, find those, those, those issues that, you know, see, you see in the world. And also, you know, consult community and, and you know, finances, because there's communal finances for a lot of stuff. And it's also just opportunity in a lot of places. Like, I've lived in Harlem my whole life, and I probably passed by his place more than one time, and I just would have never known to walk in. So, you know, a lot of it is kind of, once you get that solid foundation, you put yourself out there, and then you are going to see a lot more. You know, I think some, some uh, on our last episode with Ivy, uh, Reverend Ivy Rivera, she spoke about how through the course of enlightenment, it's several births of, you know, flowers of enlightenment. And sometimes when you get to new levels and new planes of existence, you're dealing with higher demons as well. And that opening up can sometimes create a lot. So that's why the universe works the way it is. If you aren't there yet, it's because you're not ready yet. <laughs> Let's just be honest. And to become ready is entirely not something you can prepare for. So, you know, a little cyclical stuff with that. But yeah, that's that's what I say. There are grants out there. Um, definitely reach out to people like Professor Lynch or to our organization and you know stuff like that because I think you know we you know this religious episode is very deep. So we talk a lot of spirituality, and I don't want you to get too caught up in the fact that he didn't speak too much on three dimensional stuff. It's it's such a full circle thing of what Professor James has been sp- speaking about today. Um, and I definitely take a look and go back and listen to some of his resources um, for sure because. It, you know, it, it may seem like a tough time because, you know, stimulus isn't out yet, unemployment's not out yet, and all this other hoopla and rigor moro, but, um, you know, we're here, and we're here to support anybody that's down for that. So just want to give that to our audience for sure. For sure. How, how are you doing on time, by the way? Um, I can stay for a little bit longer than I Sure. Um, well, as far as my questions, I've I've been dumbfounded um, <laughs> on all this other stuff. It's so amazing. I guess my other, you know, last leading question is: um, Are there other religious leaders that you are comfortable talking to that you enjoy, or you know, wow. you know there's a lot of new age black, you know, spiritual leaders that are kind of doing some cool stuff too. So I was curious if you were aware yeah, of. Those. Uh, I talk to, quite frankly, I'm talking to a lot of religious leaders now, mm-hmm. and. 
you know, again, as a Buddhist practitioner now, I, I don't judge. I just kind of um, accept them as they are. And I'm, even with them, I'm trying to make sure that they're happy and okay. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. a matter of uh, they're famous or not famous or. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like when you mentioned this other um, uh, individual who spoke early in the previous podcast and made me say, I'm going to listen to that podcast. Mm. That's what it made me do. Interesting. You know, let me listen. Let me listen. You know, uh, I have, um, you know, you know, I'm not looking. The happiness is here right now. Indeed. You two of you two are my teachers. Mm. You, you two yeah. are my teachers. By listening to you, I learn. Mm. Your life is telling me something. You know, and I, if I'm paying attention, that. Ooh, that's so dope. Yeah. The stillness, man, that quietness is when you see life bloom, you know, and I appreciate that we are instruments for your growth, you know, as much as you are doing that for us as well. That means a lot. That means a lot, you know, um, for sure. Uh, Caleb, <laughs> you're Buddhist yet? <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> I mean, you have I a deep meditation over there. Oh, He's <laughs> And your donations too. Oh no. my god. Oh god. Oh. I'm like a Hold on one second, guys. <laughs> That's funny. I, I am uh I've definitely definitely drawn to it even more than I was before. That's for certain. It, it's I, like I said, I, I've been writing so many things down. That's kind of why I've been a little quiet. Just um, and, and as, as Tyreek knows, I, and if you have ever listened or watched the podcast before, I, I'm a learner and I, I'm a listener. That's what I do. I, I pride myself in, in listening to people and what they have to say. Even if I have several objections, I'm going to let you finish your statement before I object. <laughs> and uh, that's something I was taught at a very young age to do. And and that's uh, that's something that I, I, I really try to pride myself in, is being able to listen to people uh, in a, every aspect. And so with, throughout the show, it, just being able to listen to you and hear everything that you have been able to um, tell us, describe to us, um, simply just, you know, not even preach to us, but ju- just say to us. Um, there are so many things that have come back to us. And, and I think Tariq's connection of this spiral was just fascinating to me and kind of sent my, sent my head into this uh, crazy ah, <laughs> state of everything that could, could you know, that is going on and, and the way that it really is, it really is kind of brilliant to think that life is a spiral. It's this constant ebb and flow thing going like this. And, and honestly, uh, side note, Tyreek, I think we might have to rebrand the podcast. Um, no more the full circle, but a spiral. Um, right, right. <laughs> and, and, I, and I mean it like if, as a joke, but also I, I really do mean that. But um, just that, sitting man. back here, <laughs> of course, being able to sit back here and just listen to everything that you said, uh, Professor James, has just, just been unbelievable honestly i was trying to find the right word but i don't think there is a word for it um because it, it's just been incredible there have been so many things um that i'm going to uh print off and put on my wall because <laughs> mm-hmm. there have just been so many amazing things um that that you've said and, and it's just been it's been it's been incredible it really has been um and so i guess i guess we can uh, <laughs> uh yeah it's the, you said that i've been converted so <laughs> uh, <laughs> you guys can call me back for any other time on different if you want to i put on a different hat and i can talk about how you can structure your businesses or that would be great i would love that actually um, totally different, totally different what approach. I, what I, I'm, I'm curious right now is um how, how does how does one get involved with some of the stuff you're doing and mm-hmm. you know how does, how does one to me, i think the thing that would be really exciting for people from where people are right now is to work mm-hmm. on the peace team um, the goal I would like to have is 2,000 to 3,000 people committed. We've got about 30 or 40, but, you know. Well, that, we'll definitely, we'll be recruiting, believe me. <laughs> 2,000 people get there and it's, you know, if people are in college or something like that, it's actually free. Um, if people uh, wanted to do the trainings, it's $30, $30 $40, dollars de minimis. Um, but the goal is really um, to change the people's hearts and minds. And to, so is it a website or you can you can actually i will put down use this i'll give you my email i don't know how to put it that thing but i'll give you my email and you can um, send it out to the people and they they're interested in that 
I'll be glad. Okay. To we'll do it like that. Yeah, we're working with other, um, other, it's not just the Buddhist community. That's mm -hmm. one. You know, we're working with the Quaker community as well. Quaker have a long history of peace work and nonviolent work. And I've given a couple of lectures to them recently in the last two or three months. And they're on board now. And, and they're like, what's next steps? And I said, let's get it big enough so we can have lectures in schools. And I, I'd really like to have, I don't want to call them armies, but like you said, superheroes of college students going out and really change yeah. the way we think about business and we think about our community. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we'll have a new type of uh, economics in our community. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and I know, you, I know you're sitting in there with the UN and just a little bit, I've been just, you know, just researching and solar and, you know, Greenpeace and, you know, it's a different, it's a change. It's definitely going to be a bigger environmental push as well as a humanitarian push. So I'm ready for it. I don't know how, you know, <laughs> ridiculous, you know, overhaul the system is going to go through before it gets fully to where we need it to be. But I'm all here for it, you know. Uh, so blessings to you and your family for definitely. Hey, everybody, through. happy holidays, happy Merry Christmas, yep. everybody. Happy post Hanukkah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, um, so yeah, if you do want to hang out with us, uh, Caleb's gonna share with them some information from okay. our side. What's the new episodes and all that fun stuff, right, Kay? So you want me to do the thing? <laughs> yeah, unless you have some other stuff to say. <laughs> All right, I will do the thing. Well, thank you again, uh, Professor James, for, for coming on and, and to be able to describe to us um, your journey, your story, and just tell us everything. And I think one of the, the greatest things um, that I, I heard tonight was, you know, bringing this happiness to light. Um, and, and so thank you. Thank you for that. That is, I, I don't think I could describe it how how grateful and thank i am to mm. to have that so thank you really yeah it's good <laughs> it is it's uh, it, thank you again it, it's it's been an absolute honor to to get to know you and discover your identity um truly and, and so it, it it's been it's been great here and as always uh tyreek and i are just so so thankful for for the this podcast Sorry, it's a little, little, little glitchy. Show and, and Sorry everything about that. that, uh, that. No, you're okay. You're okay. But once again, you've been listening to the Identity Podcast presented by Find Your ID NYC. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Find Your ID NYC. And you can check out our Instagram by the same name. Don't forget to check out our YouTube page at The X Shows and the Identity YouTube page as well. Uh, really, really great stuff, um, as always, that we've been able to uh, we, we've been able to talk about and discover. Don't forget to check out the Identity Podcast. Um, you can check out the Identity Podcast on Apple, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, whatever podcast app out there, I, I guarantee you we are on there. Check us out. Really great stuff. Don't forget to follow the Identity Podcast on TikTok, YouTube, Twitter. Um, I mean, we're all we're all over the place. We we're are all over. We we are spread. We spread it out. <laughs> it's true. We are official. <laughs> but also a really exciting announcement. We have a few exciting announcements here, but really exciting announcement to announce. Uh, something that uh, we've been working on the past month or so, but so happy to officially announce it. Starting next Tuesday, uh, December 29th, we will officially be on Brick Media, well, which is wow. which is amazing. We'll be on their radio network uh, via SoundCloud, which is just fascinating. And so every Tuesday um, for the foreseeable future, we will have a an episode of the Identity Podcast out. And so we are starting off uh, first four episodes for the next four Tuesdays, uh, starting on the 29th. Um, we'll be starting off with the on religion on religion series, and then as we continue the show, we in different series and everything, we will be uh, adding to that. So it's really fascinating, really great stuff. Cannot wait to uh, divulge into that, and, and we'll be promoting that like crazy. I can promise you, you're going to be annoyed. <laughs> but uh, great stuff there. 
And then uh, also don't forget if you if you love the Identity Podcast and want to sponsor you you want to be a part of the Identity Podcast in any sort of way, please email us at press at findyouridnyc.com. You can always reach out to myself or Tyreek um, um, via Instagram, via, via whatever platform you find. You can always reach out as well, and we will get you in contact uh, with with the press email. So that way, um, if you are interested in sponsoring us or being a part of the Identity Podcast in any sort of way, we are having a Patreon page coming out real soon uh, for 2021. Any sort of way, by all means, please do that. Once again, that's at press at findyouridnyc.com. There are lots of things... There are lots of things that um, I, I want to talk about that I, I would love to talk about. Don't forget to check out our TikTok, our Identity Podcast, all kinds of things that I'm supposed to talk about that uh, I've, I've been told that Amani wants me to, to talk about as well. Um, as always, we have several other shows for Find Your ID NYC. It's not just the Identity Podcast. Uh, we're pretty cool, but there are even cooler shows out there, and that's Pink NY. NYC Pink Talks. They do their weekly Pink Talks every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern time. It's it's a great show. It really really ta uh, tackles and focuses on women and women empowerment. It's just mm. it's amazing, really. And so check it out every single Sunday on Instagram and on Facebook. You you really should do that. Um, Trinique's every Thursday show is just a fascinating show talking about all kinds of creative arts every Thursday at 8 p.m. So tomorrow you'll be able to check out the next Trinique's and that's on Facebook as well. Don't forget to check out um, Shop Local Designers, which they do uh, are live and they kind of partner with Trinique's every Thursday, um, but definitely www.shoplocaldesigners.com. Really great stuff. And if you ever want to check out any of my writing, I'm on there as well. Little plug. Um, <laughs> but as we finally wrap up. I, I'm ending my, my little shindig of talking. Um, next week, check out next week's episode, our final episode of 2020, uh, number 21 of uh, 2020. Very excited as we get ready for 2021. Pretty Some much. exciting stuff. So our On Religion series continues and most likely ends with Stephanie Noble, um, who is an author and definitely a very, very important on, uh, in California on the uh, Buddhist spectrum and, and, and Buddhism and everything. And so I'm very excited to have her to wrap up 2020 uh, and to to just really get ready for 2021. I think it's going to be a big year and I'm very excited. And that reminds me, my last announcement, 2021 New Year's episode, our first episode on January 6th with Dreamcast McFly at 7.15 p.m. Eastern time, our brand new start time that will be um, put together starting next year. Very excited uh, for that. So stay tuned for all that. Uh, my apologies for all the talking, but lots of announcements, lots lots of exciting things to, to, uh, to discuss. And we cannot wait to see you next week for on Religion Series, once again, for the Identity Podcast, next Wednesday, the tw the 30th at 7 p.m. with Stephanie Noble. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to the Identity Podcast. Uh, I'm one of your co-hosts, Caleb, along with my fellow lovely co-host, Tyreek. It's, it's been an honor, as always. And thank you again, yeah. Professor James Lynch, for, for coming on. It's been real. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy. Yeah, I'm happy, to you, everybody. <laughs> happy New Year. Right. Happy holidays and Happy New Year. It's a lot.